as designers, we generally solve issues through design, or we understand issues through design. So in a way, the most basic mechanism that we use to solve a problem is to start designing and say, does that fit, does this fit? And it's very clumsy, actually. It's very messy, and in a way, it's kind of frustrating. No, I mean, I, I had a huge frustration having worked in previous practices in that way of drawing, a way of thinking of elevations with windows positioned as a kind of composition. I think a window should be positioned because it lets light in or creates a view, has a kind of role to play in a building. That investigation started at the AA 23 years ago when I was a student. Well, at the time we were doing a kind of master planning project using computers in an, uh, John Fraser's unit, Evolutionary Architecture Unit. I decided to look at sunlight on its own uh, and spent that whole year investigating that. Sunlight is a really interesting thing because clearly here there's a very analytical way that you looked at sunlight. But do you think you were drawn to it because, dare I say, you liked it, you were interested in its qualities, but didn't know how to harness it? Yes. I mean, I actually found I didn't understand. I was 34 years old, had worked for 10 years and studied architecture, and I didn't understand the movement of the earth around the sun and think, you know, critical issues like that, and how important they are as a generative tool in architecture. So I became very interested in the differences around the planet initially and how that produces different architectures. I think specifically looking at uh, vernacular architecture and how very simply people place houses in the right place, in the right slope, away from certain aspects and how those rules could be embedded in a computer model, essentially is what I was doing. Did John Fraser help you understand that issue specifically, do you think? Yeah, I remember the first kind of approach I made to him. I made a kind of fundamental mistake of, I think I even used the word random, and kind of sunlight was random. Actually, it's entirely predictable. You can mathematically know where the sun is going to be at any time of the day, anywhere on this planet. And that's something that's really interesting I think, when you use computer tools, because it can be embedded within it. And do you think in places like Marrakesh, people who build there in a vernacular way carry that embodied knowledge of how to do it without having to necessarily map that place? Well, I mean, absolutely. I think that's what's so interesting. And, and I'd probably honestly say that the two years I spent in the unit, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't understand it fully at all. It's only become clear afterwards. This was our, the lighthouse project, and this was after a few months of analysing that site and breaking down the data on the site into 6,000 points in space, and all the attributes attributed to, to those points in space. And the colours here represent different levels of sunlight and daylight. And what we were starting to do is understand the three-dimensional forms that, that are generated, not just slicing it horizontally, but actually how, how they are three-dimensionally in, in the site itself. So what am I actually looking at if I look at, say, this point relative to, which is yellow, relative to this one down here, which is an isolated white point? Yeah, so that, that would be a range of sunlight hours, three-dimensionally in that space, and that would be a different range. What we start to do here, for instance, is take what the client's desires were for, say, specific light conditions, and overlay them with the data. So if they wanted a, a study that had early morning light and maybe it was quite kind of calm and serene the rest of the day, we might choose certain conditions mm. within this model. And that would go when you start thinking about how you might design something as straightforward as a house is, you know, breakfast 
morning sun, evening, come home from work, afternoon sun, and so on. So those start becoming overlaid, and you start to be able to organize them on the site based on those rules. I remember maybe you know, 30 years ago when I lived in North London in summertime, being desperate at the end of the day for a piece of sunlight. Yeah. You know? I mean, you've been inside all day, you've been working, and you, know, you go back home, you lived in a flat, and you had no mechanism of actually getting that chink of sunlight. And here in London, what's interesting is that when I was at the AA, I remember my tutors saying to me, there is no sunlight in London, you know, it's always nine degrees and drizzly. Mm -hmm. But, of course, that's kind of wrong. But I think, as a culture, we crave those pieces of sunlight mm. in December or October or January or February, you know. I mean, I think that cultural aspect is incredibly interesting because we are all different and we've grown up in different places. And in this country, it is something we, we really want and we really want to feel that and embrace it when it happens. So in that project, it was exactly that. But at the same time, there was kind of interesting things that that client specifically wanted, like dark bedrooms. I wasn't expecting that, and it's not what I like, but they were happy with dark bedrooms. And because of that, we were able to turn the section upside down and put all the lighter level rooms upstairs in a kind of double height space and all the bedrooms on the lower floor and take the section right up to this point where there was that cloud of all year round light so that even on the day with the least sunlight, it will just hit it and just come into the house and kind of be drawn through it. When you finished that project, where did you go next? The, I think the next project we were working on was the house in Costa Rica for my father, Casa Quique. So a lot of the conversations with him were actually about power. So I'm his son and I'm your architect at the same time. So actually I'm, I need to be in control of the design of this project. And that was a big kind of shift for him, not being in control of me. Was, that, it, was that, it a happy relationship then? Yeah, I mean, it was a kind of very transformative relationship between the two of us and very important. And I think he recognised and appreciated what I did after that. I think he hadn't before that. But when he understood what it meant, I use the analogy of editors. He was a writer, so editors used to meddle in his work, which frustrated him endlessly. And when I kind of explained that that's what he was doing, he was kind of trying to edit what I had written, he understood that he would need to stand back and support the project better. And so what did you learn in that project? Kasek so, Kike. again, that partly goes back to this cultural question and partly goes back to the physical aspects of what you need to do in that climate. So, But that is in Costa Rica with a very open site compared to these sites. Um, yeah, it's, it, it's in the countryside, in the jungle, but not open in the sense that you've got kind of canopies of amazing trees and jungle behind you and the sea in front of you. So yes, it's, it's a village-like jungle uh, site. But, but the issue was the same? Well, the issue is the same and the, the question was the same. So how do you deal with sunlight or how is it important in the project? So there it was about excluding light, sunlight, but allowing these kind of extraordinary views to the sea and the jungle. And what we did is generate a form through that that uh, excluded the, the path of the sun. So it was very specific to the path of the sun on that site and ended up with this kind of twisted parallelogram plan and three-dimensional form with completely open glazed elevations to the kind of sea and to the jungle. So all of these models are from for house and a garden, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, these are all iterations of this process that we're talking about. So that one actually is the space around the 
roof, isn't it? I mean, it's that's the volume. actually built in a different way, yes. So this is the, the volume that becomes the skylight. is actually turned upside down compared to the other models. And the other ones are uh, fabric, stretched fabric over essentially where we found this skylight should be, the oculus, to the edges that are defining where the gardens are. And then that form that that's generated, a kind of draped and stretched fabric, almost like a tent, was what we started to investigate in all these models here. Twenty-three years after you started on a very particular road, which is this framework, this type of looking at an issue through the lens of sunlight, we're sitting in your recently completed house in a garden. So what process did you use to begin looking at this site rigorously, not through the sort of anecdotal being a neighbour, being interested method? Yes, so I was very aware how overshadowed this site was. You've got five-storey house to the south of the site, so it's a north-facing garden, and four-storey houses on other sides blocking out a lot of the light, kind of gaps between the buildings that actually became crucial. What we've actually ended up, when you, when you understand it now, is three sources of light, so the, the two garden areas and the skylight are where the light is, and the house is actually built where the shadow is. If you look at this roof, is there a direct link between the shape of it and some environmental condition that exists here? Well, it's an overall environmental condition. It's again a kind of average, optimal place to put a skylight in this three-dimensional volume that would generate the most amount of light all year round. So it's just positioning this skylight really in the maximum daylight, sunlight collecting position you could find, but then affecting everybody else as little as possible. So we've come down one level, haven't we? When what, three and a half metres below ground or something? Yeah, this is one of two light wells courtyards that serve the first basement, but they also have skylights that serve the lowest basement. And this small courtyard is, is uh, bringing light into the guest bedroom, the hallway, and a guest bathroom. Something very particular happens in this house, which is unusual in a London house, which is that you're transported into another world mm. of experiential issue, you know, the sky, the sun, the light, the atmosphere. And when you come downstairs, in a way, you are slightly disorientated, but then to be reminded of where you are and see this Victorian context again is very unusual. Yes, and it does depend where you are in the room itself. So some places you are situated and it's completely private, and other places you connect back to these views and the gardens above. Typically people think that you want direct sunlight on you or a place that you can sit in the sun in you know, spring or autumn. But actually, do you think that just to see that patch of sunlight, that's as good in some yes, ways. I think uh, as long as there's a connection and le as long as you know what's happening, that's I think the kind of crucial aspect of it. I think slow architecture is very important and I think being able to work like that is critical to what we're investigating. 